cheap to drive. <laughs> well, it's a very great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Holly Gillett of the uh, uh, Goddard Space Flight Center, and to welcome her husband and daughters. Uh, uh, she got her bachelor's in physics from the University of Colorado, and while an undergraduate, she was a student assistant at the High Altitude Observatory at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. Uh, and that caused her to become deeply interested in the physics of the sun. And after graduating, she continued there, first as an associate scientist and then as a visiting scientist, while concurrently working on her PhD in theoretical astrophysics, which she obtained from the University of Oslo in Norway. Unusual combination. <laughs> Very interesting and delightful. Her thesis work uh, was on phenomena associated with coronal mass ejections, which are very much in the news these days, because they have dramatic effects on space weather, affecting systems on and around the Earth and spacecraft. After three years as a research scientist at after three years as a research scientist at Rice University. Uh, Dr. Gilbert came to Goddard, where she's now the Associate Director for Science in the Heliophysics Division and the Chief of the Solar Physics Laboratory. Besides her scientific research, she's served on many review panels and committees and has chaired special sessions at major scientific meetings and done wonderful work explaining to scientists and to the public the significance of the explosion of new discoveries about the sun and space weather. Uh, in particular, she was featured in a PBS special, special program on that topic. And to express appreciation for one of her contributions <coughs> to the Lightning students and the public, in 2007, the Holly Gilbert Solar Telescope was dedicated at the St. George Observatory in Shreveville, Louisiana. Today, she will tell us about remarkable new discoveries. Thank you. <laughs> so much for that introduction. Are we going to be able to turn the lights? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. perfect, because I was like, this is going to be hard. Red lights see. only. This is, I, I understand, this is a group of nighttime astron astronomers, <laughs> and I'm a daytime astronomer, so I'm actually very uh, glad that you invited me here to, to speak, because I um, sometimes like to mingle with the dark side. <laughs> but I, I'm especially glad to come talk about the sun. Um, as my family will tell you, that's the, my favorite topic to talk about, and they're probably sick to death of hearing about it, but for some reason they wanted to come tonight, so. That's great. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to be talking about the dynamic phenomena on the sun and how that impacts us here on Earth um, in the context of SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, which is um, a mission that launched in 2010. So I'm going to be showing a ton of movies and data and really pretty pictures. And uh, it's feel free to, answer, to ask questions. I'll answer them while I'm talking or afterwards. Either way is fine. But also, if I'm not loud enough, let me know so you can hear back. Okay. All right. Well, let's get started then. Um, why do we care? Why should we even study the sun or understand anything about the sun? Well, actually, we live inside the solar atmosphere. And so it becomes very important for us to understand how this impacts us. So this is just an animation, not to scale, but this shows that the sun has this this huge bubble around it, and this is called the heliosphere. And this is a region where solar wind, which is constantly emanating from the sun, it's constantly blowing out its atmosphere at a million miles an hour. And most people don't realize that, that the solar wind it passes Earth, passes through the entire solar system, and actually uh, hits this edge of the solar system called the heliosphere. And so this is an animation just showing how that might look if we were able to zoom way out look at the, uh, the solar system, what I want you to notice is that it's not just static. The, sort of the theme of this whole talk is dynamic behavior. And, and this whole heliosphere is actually breathing. It kind of looks like it's breathing. And that's because the solar wind that is moving outward and pressing out against this bubble, which is also magnetic field, that solar wind and the way that it comes out of the sun varies with time. And I'm going to talk about the solar cycle and how that changes. But you can see through this animation that it's not a static uh, environment. 
And, and here we are, right in the middle of it. And so all this solar wind and everything that happens on the sun will impact us um, somewhat directly. So that's, that is why we should care about what's going on on the sun. In, in addition to the fact that it's very interesting, it's just inherently very cool. Well, I very think hot. It's, yes, it's very hot. <laughs> yes, I mean we. It, the sun gives us life and, and warmth. Yes, question. Okay, what was the sphere? Okay, so the sphere. This sphere is. Uh, this is basically where the the very fast solar wind ends, and then it slows down. So you get this termination shock. Basically, it's the same thing if you turn on your faucet in the sink and you see an area where the water is, is quickly moving out, yep. and then you see a round edge, and this is the same thing. You have very fast uh, solar wind, and this is just the edge of where that ends, and then it's slower past here. Yep. Now, now, when uh, the pioneers or, or oh, the Viking, the, yep. which one, was it the spear or the... Uh, so uh, that's, uh, yes, Voyager 1 and 2. Uh, which is very, it's very neat right now because Voyager 1, they think, has entered actually <coughs> through this area here. And so it's, it's past this. And it, there's still some debate as to whether it's really outside into interplanetary space. Some people say absolutely it is. And the reason it's hard to know, because we don't know exactly what to expect out in interplanetary space. We can, we have some theories. I'm sorry, inter interstellar, yes, I'm, I'm just used to thinking closer to home, interstellar space, and the magnetic field, we can um, theorize that it should be a different, a certain direction, and the density, and so getting the measurements now, there are, the, the, uh, the other problem is that it's not necessarily a smooth surface like I'm showing here, there are regions where it might, might go full back on itself, and so Voyager 1 might have just entered into one of these little areas where it's kind of interstellar space, but not really, and then it might enter back. So there's a lot of debate. In the next couple of years, I think we'll know for sure. But it's very, very exciting that we actually have a mission that is outside of this environment. Okay, what makes the sun dynamic? And that's a reasonable question. But um, before I go into some of the details, let's just first touch on some basics, because I think I need to slowly bring some light to this crowd. Again, nighttime astronomers, right? <laughs> so, here's a nice picture of a, of a sunrise or a sunset, and this is what you know people generally think of when they think of the sun. It's just nice and quiet and peaceful. But it's just another star. Exactly, yeah, exactly, it's true. It's, it's just another star. This is what it looks like through a camera lens. Again, you know, it's pretty, just kind of peaceful, static. And this is what it looks like uh, from a telescope. And most people are familiar with sunspots, or have at least heard of them. And many people have probably seen them. I mean, it's, I think that's a pretty common thing to be aware of. And this is just a, an image of the photosphere, which is the lowest layer of the solar atmosphere. And it's the visible part of the surface. So we can see, uh, basically, these dark areas here called sunspots. And I'm going to talk about those in detail in a bit. But I just wanted to introduce you to the lowest layer of the solar atmosphere, the photosphere. And this is about mm, 4,500 to 5,000 Kelvin. And Kelvin is just a unit of, of temperature, and it's, uh, I think that's, I don't know what the conversion is. I think one Kelvin equals about minus 470 some yeah, Fahrenheit. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Was, Body temperature is 310. Yeah. So, so I'll be talking in Kelvin, but when you get to such high temperatures and such high, large numbers, it, it doesn't really matter too much. But um, Now, the, this is the extended atmosphere of the sun, and it's only visible when you block out the very bright surface. So this is a very, very, very bright disk of the sun. We can't see the extended layer of the atmosphere unless we block that out, which naturally occurs with total solar eclipses. And I just saw my, total, my first total solar eclipse for the first time last year. And it is an amazing, incredible experience. I hope that some of you have been able to see them. Yes, yes. We've um, seen incredible. a few. Yeah, I saw. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Unbelievable. But I wanted to show you this uh, image just to point out that there are these little structures here, these little pink structures. Actually, there's not a ton of them, but there's some here. That is, that is part of the chromosphere, which is the middle layer of the solar atmosphere. And then this white stuff out here is the corona. And so it's just the very, very hot part of the solar atmosphere. And I'm going to show you the temperature variation throughout the solar atmosphere in a bit. But to give you an idea, 
that there are different layers of the atmosphere, in fact. Well, this is nice because here is an uh, image taken by a satellite called SOHO, and this is showing the surface, but we can also, we're also, this is overlaid, so this is a composite image. So you can see the corona and these very detailed structures, and these are magnetic fields. <coughs> these like loop-like structures here. Now this data, this was a, a total solar eclipse uh, that was imaged, and then that data was processed so that, we, that you could pull out these very detailed, fine structured um, regions. But you can see that they connect to other things on the surface of the sun. Here's one of those uh, things that were sticking out on the eclipse picture, and this is part of the chromosphere. And it's a very, very complicated structured region. And this is actually uh, during, a, a region, uh, during a time where it's fairly simple. And I'm going to talk about the solar cycle um, and how it varies. But that just to give you an idea. That was the eclipse in Turkey, was it? which many of us saw. Fantastic. <laughs> I wish I, wish I would have been there. Now, to, to view the uh, corona outside of times where there are no total solar eclipses, because you can only count on those every once in a while, uh, we put telescopes in space that act like fake eclipses. And they, they basically put a, an occulting disk in front of that very bright surface of the sun, which is about a million times brighter than the corona. So you really need to block it out. And that's what this, this large dark region is here. That's just that occulting disk acting like the moon, um, although it's much more extended than the moon is. The moon is just the right size uh, when you get a total solar eclipse. But this allows us to see the extended corona uh, at any time with space-based observations. And again, this is just a composite laying the uh, original one on top of the coronagraph, which is what the instrument is called, uh, showing that fake eclipse. Okay. Well, this is what the corona looks like on the disk. This is taken from SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, and we're looking at multiple wavelengths. So we can look at different layers in the solar atmosphere by looking at different temperatures. Again, the photosphere is cooler than the chromosphere, which is a little hotter, and then the corona is very hot. And you can only see it when you're looking in certain wavelengths. And these, this is an extreme ultraviolet, and we're looking at three different temperatures, three different wavelengths. And I think they, they, it goes from about a million degrees to two and a half million degrees, uh, which is the, the red. So this is very interesting to see because look at all these incredible structures. And this is the very, very hot outer part of the solar atmosphere. So it's much different than just looking at that photospheric picture with sunspots. Question. Could you line us up with the axis, of the spin axis of that? Sure. So this actually, I think that they have this aligned. So this is north and this is south. And the sun rotates from this direction, that direction. Okay, so those are lined up with the equator. This is the equator, correct. Okay. Um, so they, they shifted the image so that north was actually up. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and this is, this is a, a satellite that is in a geocentric uh, orbit, so it's near the Earth. Which color is which? Uh, the, so the, the, the red is from the 211 angstrom wavelength, and then 193 is green, and 171 angstroms. And these are iron lines, and the, the red is the hottest, and the green is the middle hottest. Is that right? The blue? <laughs> or is it the other way around? 171 is quite hot. I'm sorry, I think it's the other way around. So the blue is actually hot. Generally, people color things red as hot, right? <laughs> and blue is cool, so it's a little confusing. Um, but if, if you were just looking at one of these wavelengths, it would look a little different. You wouldn't see everything. And so it's very important to look at a variety of wavelengths. Otherwise, you're missing major parts of the solar atmosphere. And again, this looks quite different than the actual surface or the photosphere. OK, I promised to talk about the temperature structure because I've been saying numbers. But what's very interesting about this, and you don't really need to understand this very much, but what I want you to notice is here is basically the photosphere. On this, on this edge here. And so this is temperature and height above the photosphere. So the photosphere here, you start going up into the solar atmosphere, and you expect it to cool off because you're moving away from this, the energy source, which is at the core, and that's where fusion is taking place. So you, you start to cool off, but then all of a sudden, you're moving further and further away from the surface, and you start to heat up. And all of a sudden, you jump in a, in a huge way. You, you, this, this temperature, you go from about 10,000 degrees to a million degrees in a very, very short distance. 
um, on the, we don't really know exactly that distance, but it's on the order of maybe 50 miles, which in, in terms of the sun is, is incredibly small. So this is a very interesting thing that happens on the sun. And one of the main problems in solar physics is why is the corona so much hotter than the <coughs> lower uh, layers of the atmosphere? Density? Density is part of it, but I mean, it's still, it's very, it's, it's, it's less dense by or two orders of magnitude, so right, right. so it falls off in density right, and raises in temperature. More, yeah, so the it's, temperature is just a measure of the movement. Yep. Right? So it's it's very. I mean, there are, I'll talk a little. I think I have some slides, or at least I'll talk about what those theories are as to why it's getting so hot. Uh, this is just to kind of show you that we have a lot of tools at our disposal to study the sun. I, again, just a demonstration of the sun in different wavelengths, but we also have sophisticated models, which we need. We can't just look at the sun in these observations and understand what's going on. We really need the help of models that can help tell us what is going on. And also, the models need the observations in order to determine if they're correct or you know, how accurate they are. So it's a very nice synergy between observations and modeling that help us to understand the amount of the, of the knowledge that we have about the sun, which you'll see, we actually we know a lot, but there's a lot we don't know. <laughs> and so it's kind of job security in a way, because there's so much <laughs> that we need to still learn. Um, and so far, I've just talked about the surface and above, uh, you know, what we can see and, and above that. But I haven't really mentioned yet inside the sun, which is kind of where a lot of the action is taking place. This is just a, a diagram to show you that the core is where all the energy is being produced. In fusion. So you get all this energy being produced at the core, and you get gamma rays being produced, and then they start this random walk process through the radiative zone, which is where that's how the, the energy gets um, transported, is through energy. Basically, the, uh, the gamma rays, they start out as gamma rays, the photons get absorbed and then re-emitted at lower energies many, many, many times, millions of times, because there's no there's no uh, direction, so one can get absorbed, re-emitted back down, and it's just this total random uh, direction of getting um, absorbed and re-emitted. So it can take 100,000 years um, or more for one photon to get through this particular part of the zone, of the, of the sun, the radiative zone. And then this other part of the zone, of the, of the layer, of the inner part of the sun is called the convection zone, and that's where uh, the energy then is transported through conduction, just like boiling pot of water. The photons kind of hitchhike a ride, uh, is what I like to, to think of it. They, they get absorbed and then they get taken up through these pillars of hot, of hot plasma. I should mention, the sun is a big ball of plasma. It's not solid, so it's a big ball of hot gas. And this gas gets boiled up and then it comes back down after it cools, and so there's this rotating effect in this convection zone. And then once the photons finally get released uh, from the surface, then, they're, you know, then they can escape and reach the Earth in eight minutes. So it's a very arduous journey through this part of the sun. Um, and I, this is just to show you there are many, many different types of things on the sun. I'm going to be talking about a lot of these prominences, sunspots. Uh, so. <coughs> Let's get back to the interesting stuff, which is the, uh, scale, yes. The diagram to scale. No, no, it's, it, it's kind of generally, I mean, in a general way, but, but it's not really, I mean, the, the uh, it's, it's not too bad, but it's not exactly, it wasn't meant to be too exactly to scale, but it's, it's sort of a, an estimate. And what is the white thing around the core? Um, you know, I don't know why, I think this is just to show that it's a sphere. I don't think this means anything, this white part here. I'm not sure, actually. That's a good question. But it's nothing real. The core is just a, a big ball of fusion. Okay. So there basically are three main <coughs> ingredients uh, that make the sun dynamic. And I've already mentioned magnetic fields. I've already mentioned plasma. And the fact that the sun rotates and it's not a solid ball, so it rotates at different speeds. So these are kind of the three main things that go into making it so dynamic. So magnetic fields, we're all familiar with them. We have refrigerator magnets. Um, probably, at least a, at some point in school, you did the iron filings experiment, of course, and many of you, I'm sure, have, because I think a lot of you are scientists. Um, and you can see magnetic fields only when the iron 
uh, outlines the fields because you can't see them; they're invisible. So you need some substance to to follow those uh, those magnetic fields to see them. And on the sun, if you think about magnetic fields or putting a magnet on the sun on the surface, part of that part of the fields are going to be sticking out of the surface. And luckily, there's a hot plasma that acts just like the iron filings and allows us to see the magnetic fields. And here's a real image. And you can see those, those loops of hot plasma outlining the uh, magnetic field. So that's how we know that these, what the magnetic fields look like on the sun. Otherwise, we would not be able to observe them because they are visible. I mean, they're invisible otherwise. Um, OK, so we've got the, the hot plasma on the magnetic fields allowing us to see things. Uh, rotation is what really kind of twists things up and causes a lot of chaos. And the equator of the sun rotates more rapidly than the polar regions. And what happens is, if you can imagine that you have sort of these magnetic fields along the north and the south, fairly simple, the sun starts rotating more quickly, and so the magnetic fields on that part of the surface are getting pulled along more quickly. And they, they start to kind of get this shape. And that happens over a long period of time. All of a sudden, you've got this twisted mess of magnetic fields all over the sun. And in little regions, it's twisting. Not only is it twisting around, but there's internal rotation going on as well. And, and so you have all of these things messing with the magnetic fields, twisting, twisting, twisting. And they can get so twisted up that they pop through the surface and create these little regions. And that's where sunspots are formed. Question. Yes. The fields go bend towards the uh, rotation. They do. They do and because that, yeah, because yeah. the rotation carries the field basically with it, and got so it. and okay. so they they originally they start that way, but then right. there's more. That's a very simplified version. So yes. you get a lot of other weird stuff going on as well. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. If you look at these, these areas where these loops and these twisted field lines, so if you take a, a twisted flexor or a foam cord, and I know we were just talking about this at dinner, that most people, the young folks, don't know what foam cord, cords are anymore. <laughs> They've never seen them. But you remember, like, when you, they would, your, your foam cord would get all twisted up and it would get kinked. You had to unplug it and, like, hold it up so that it would unwind because it was all kinked up. So this is kind of what happens with these magnetic flux tubes. They're like these foam cords that get all twisted, twisted up, and they can kink. And they form sunspots because the bundles where they're coming and poking up through the surface are where sunspots form. They're, they're regions of very intense magnetic field. And here is a, a image. This is real data looking on the solar disk. Oh, it does not look good on the screen. Uh, but you can see these are the sunspots and the loops. Now, they don't they look just like this cartoon, right? The loops that go in and out. And they have different polarities, meaning the north and the south. Uh, this is exactly, and this is a very simplified way of thinking of it. But this is, this is what we think is causing sunspots. Let's look at sunspots more carefully. So this is a movie. Uh, this is real data. Oh, it's, oh, shoot. It's not appearing great on the screen. Um, at least you can see some of the detail. Um, so this is a zoomed in on a, on a sunspot, but not just one. You can see that there are a few sunspots here. There are about three. So a lot of times sunspots form in groups. And these are the regions where space weather occurs. These are the, the culprits of what we call space weather, where they're causing solar storms. I'll talk a lot more about that. But just to give you an idea, sorry, this movie is not. Mass ejection. Yes, mm -hmm. which I'm going to be talking a lot about, since that's my favorite, favorite topic. <laughs> but while we're on the topic of sunspots, um, I'm going to review what the, the solar cycle is. Because generally, when we think of the solar cycle, which means that the sun has periods of time where it's very, very active, but there are tons of sunspots, and then other periods where there are no sunspots or very few sunspots. And this is called solar maximum and solar minimum. And this, this is an image, these are images of the solar corona. So not the surface where we see the sunspots, but the corona. And this is the difference in solar maximum, what it looks like, and solar minimum. So it's a very different looking corona. Not only are the sunspots there to represent solar maximum, but the corona looks different. So this happens on average every 11 years. In fact, we are right now at solar maximum. 
which is very neat. I mean, there's, there's more activity than there was certainly a few years ago. We, uh, we went through a very, very low uh, mild solar minimum where we weren't seeing anything for a long period of time. So there's a variation not just in the actual number of sunspots and how active the sun is, but the type and the, the strength of the solar <coughs> maximum also varies. I'll show you that. Um, the, the poles reverse their magnetic field, and in fact, we just went through that since we're at solar maximum. So this happens every 11 years as well. And this just means the amplitude of sunspots. So the number of sunspots varies from 0 to 250, and there is a small change in energy um, output. In fact, when there are fewer sunspots or no sunspots, the, the Earth has a bit of cooling. And in fact, there was a period of time, I think I, I, think I have that slide, where uh, we call Maunder Minimum, which cor corresponded with uh, the little ice age here on Earth. So what's happening on the sun does impact overall global average climate a little bit. Um, so it's kind of interesting that when we just came out of a very deep solar minimum a few years ago, the Earth was actually warming. And so it, 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 there, there are, I, it's not my area, and then there's a lot of controversy, of course, going on, uh, but the, uh, the sun does impact uh, global climate just a little bit. Okay, so this is, a, this is a plot of the number of sunspots down here. So this is the year 1870 all the way up to 2010, although we haven't filled in this yet. And you can see the number of sunspots increases, that solar maximum, on average every 11 years. But look at, this is a very high solar maximum. This is a very strong solar maximum compared to, say, this one. This is a pretty weak solar minimum or solar maximum. The one that we are in right now is weaker than here. And although I don't have that plotted, we are in a very weak solar maximum, meaning there aren't that many sunspots compared to some of these other ones. We don't understand why this varies and why there's an actual pattern, not just on the 11-year cycle, but in overall general, perhaps there's patterns in the, in the long-term uh, variation as well. This is just a plot of, the, of how the sunspots act. So they, they migrate towards the equator, and this is the same time. So you can see during solar maximum, let's look at this big solar maximum. During solar maximum, you get basically <coughs> sunspots near the mid regions, and they're migrating slowly towards the equator. And then all of a sudden, when the new cycle starts, they come, they start appearing at the poles. And so this is kind of a neat spatial uh, thing that happens as well. Yes? Question, how confident are you of the absence of data points at high latitudes? Oh, very good question. So we can only see for, well, now we have stereo. We can see behind the sun, but we can only see one side of the sun for most of this time. All, most all of this time. And, and this, the sun is not completely, it's, it's tilted a little bit away. And so you're right, we can't see the polar regions very well. However, sunspots really don't occur where there's open fields. And the polar regions is where they have open field, meaning that it, it extends way out. It doesn't, it's not actually open, but it extends way, way out. And you need regions where it's more closed to, to form sunspots. So we're, we're confident. But you're absolutely right. Observationally, we, we can't see exactly on the poles. There's a mission coming up that I'm involved with that is going to have a, a tilt at about 34 degrees, and we're going to be able to observe directly the poles. So that's very exciting. Thank you. Yep. Here, again, this is... Uh, this is data from SOHO, which was a mission that has provided the most incredible solar data um, for many, many years. It really changed our understanding of solar physics. But here again is the solar corona near solar minimum, 1996, which is actually when I, right, right, right about when I got in the field. And here it is uh, during solar maximum, just three years later. You can see there are significant differences in the corona. There are lots of these white active regions. They're very bright because the hot plasma is getting trapped by the magnetic fields, which are more complicated here. You have more closed field regions, and they're tra it's trapping the hot plasma, and that's why you get these regions of hot, hot plasma. And what I was just saying about open field in the polar regions, you can see that there's not much plasma stuck there, and that's because it's sort of basically open. But very, very quiet, even though the sun's never really, really quiet, but relatively speaking. And here's the the uh, white light data of the corona. And you can see the difference, I'll show you the difference between minimum and maximum at solar eclipses. This 
again, there's not much material, and so we call this a coronal hole because there's just not much coronal material getting trapped by magnetic field lines. And these are helmet streamers and just regions of magnetic field trapping the hot plasma. And again, I mentioned the solar wind before, which is always emanating away from the sun. Now I'll show you the difference with solar maximum. So this is quite, quite different. Very complicated. And this is a multipolar uh, configuration, so the magnetic field is more complicated. You get all these streamers even near the poles. So in, in, in during solar maximum, you do, get, you do get some closed field regions near the poles. But look at the difference. You get this nice dipolar magnetic field. In, in this case, the, the north is right as this, it's tilted this way. So this is very interesting to study uh, the, the activity cycle and, and how it affects the corona and the, uh, the surface as well. How much difference in those two pictures uh, is due to the fact that one's the equatorial and the other's polar? At least that's what I understood you to say. Um, this, it's, it, this is tilted. They're both tilted the same way. Um, so, in fact, this is actually here. And the thing about solar maximum, when you're looking at the corona like this, you can't really determine where exactly the north and south poles are. And that's because, again, it's become this very complicated magnetic structure um, overall instead of just the nice two kind of equatorial regions. So you're, you're right in that the solar minimum is more just equator-driven kind of uh, streamers. But when, when it's maximum, those streamers are everywhere, so it's not necessarily equatorial. I, okay, the, the sun, I, I've been talking about magnetic fields a lot. The sun is magnetically driven. It drives everything, magnet, magnetism drives everything that's going on on the sun. And I, I like to refer to this as a space weather zoo because a lot of things happen because of magnetic fields and, and the fact that they're moving around on the sun. I've already mentioned the solar wind. I'm going to show you some of these large-scale waves that uh, propagate across the solar surface. Solar flares, which I'm sure everybody has heard of, and especially in the news. Um, coronal mass ejections, which I think everybody, a lot of people have heard of, and solar prominences. And these are all just different types. Some of these are related, and I'll talk about how they're related. Uh, but there's a lot of different, different behavior, phenomena to study um, on the sun. Let me uh, show you how this corona can be very complicated when the surface is moving around. Let's see. Oh. No, whoops. Hold on. I thought I had a movie linked. Rachel, did I have one linked? Yeah. I did on this? No, it was on the title. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it wasn't on the title either. Okay. Got to get your experts to I know. Right? <laughs> Seriously. Involve your children. Exactly. They know more. Okay, well, don't worry. There are plenty of movies. <laughs> um, here are these global waves that I was mentioning before. Okay, this is not, the projector is not great, but you can see we're actually looking at H alpha, which is showing the chromosphere, and helium 10830, which just means. 10, uh, 10, 8, 30 angstrom, and we're looking at the same event, which if, you, if you've noticed by now, there's this large blast wave coming from this region, yeah. and it's pretty, it's pretty obvious once you, once you know where to look. And these global waves happen when we have big solar flares and other things ejecting from the sun. Yes? Does it originate around the sunspot? It does. It? Yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, these regions where you have the very bright regions are where sunspots are formed. And again, it's because that's where the bundles of magnetic field pop up and then they're closed and they trap the, the, the plasma. So yes, that's exactly right. These are the regions where these types of things occur and originate from. And so that, actually you can, actually, you can see a sunspot right there, um, that black spot there. But it's pretty neat that these huge waves travel across such a, la a large part of the surface. And these can travel as, as fast as, well, the ones that we've measured, I think we've measured one up to 2,500 kilometers per second. So they can be quite, oh, I said the range right there. I thought I was right. Let me show you what they look like in the coronal data. Because not only are we seeing them in the chromosphere, yeah, this will replay so in case you missed it. So it's a big puff originating from this active region, mm -hmm. and it goes all directions. Mm -hmm. It travels that's all the way real, up. That's not real time. Though, right? It's not. This is every uh, 12 minutes. 
And so you can see it's moving, this is moving quite fast, uh, the, the movie is. Um, but again, I think this one was traveling at 600 kilometers per second. Very, very fast. It, it has global uh, implications. It can cause other things to go on. And so these waves are very, very interesting. Uh, they're one of the things that I've studied in my past research. Flares. Okay, that's the thing that most people have heard of. And, and I, it's the thing that is most, it, it's represented incorrectly in the media more than anything I've seen. Because usually when they're saying, oh, a big solar flare happened on the sun today, and here's a beautiful image of it, they're not showing you a flare. They're usually showing you a solar prominence, which I'm going to show you in a bit. So I, it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine because they're not showing you actual flares. Let me show you what a flare looks like. And flares also occur in these regions where sunspots um, are. And this is a zoomed in region. So this is just a very small portion of the sun. And we're looking at about a million to a million and a half degrees, or Kelvin. And all of a sudden you get this very bright region and then these loops, those are magnetic fields. And they're reconfiguring and they're very, very hot and then they cool off. And so first the very bright part is actually on the order of 10 million Kelvin. Uh, so they're very, very hot compared to the even hot corona. They're extremely energetic events. In fact, they're the most energetic events that happen in the solar system. These can be very, very energetic. Let me show you, I think I have another one. Oh, thought I did. That's okay, that one was pretty neat to see. Um, so the, the energy that I was just talking about, here are some comparisons. So it's, a, it's equivalent to 1 million trillion 100 watt light bulbs. It's kind of hard to imagine those numbers. <laughs> <laughs> that is a lot. So what I, what, this actually what the sun today, this is a great website if you want to learn more about the sun. Uh, what Alex Young has done is said, okay, well, if you think of it in terms of phenomena, if you, if, if you love crazy phenomena here on Earth, you can uh, you make the analogy, uh, you can one solar flare, which is you know, one powerful solar flare, is equal to about 250 magnitude 9 earthquakes, or 500 hurricanes, or 20,000 times the world energy consumption yearly, or 10 million volcanic eruptions, or 10,000 trillion lightning bolts. So <laughs> it depends on you know what your favorite uh, uh, phenomena, crazy phenomena on the Earth is. You can compare, but the the point is. Solar flares are incredibly energetic, really, really, really energetic, and we need to worry about them. I'll tell you why in a bit. What causes them, why, why are they so energetic? What causes flares? What happens, so we know that these are magnetic fields, this, these loops, and they have a direction. Some, so you have one, you have north and south, and so you have a magnetic field pointing up, coming in, and going on to the other side of the, of the sun, and sometimes, these magnetic fields uh, are next to ones that are pointed oppositely. So you have some that are pointed down and some up, and what happens when those come together is what we call magnetic reconnection, which is this incredibly energetic, uh, explosive event that changes this. It takes all the magnetic energy and, and basically converts it to thermal energy or heat, and that's why the flares are so hot. Um, it's a micro, it's a, it's, this process takes place at a very, very, very tiny, tiny scale, and we're still studying it to fully understand. And this doesn't only happen on the, on the sun. It, can, it ha happens near the Earth as well with the Earth's magnetic field. It's a, it's a very important process to understand and, and causes all of space weather events. Just for fun, here's a cartoon to show you uh, a little bit more complicated uh, thing that can happen. So if, if you imagine that this is a magnetic field, the loop, and these regions and the, the loop are getting pushed together for whatever reason. You know, there's a lot of motion on the sun. Things can happen. If they get pushed together, then they reconnect and reconfigure so that all of a sudden, there, this is, becomes one long magnetic field, and you get what we call a flux rope. And then you have this other field. It basically reconfigures magnetic fields, which is a very, very difficult thing to do, and that's why it's so energetic. And this is just one very simplified cartoon. You can imagine the sun is much more complicated than this. You can imagine that magnetic reconnection is probably occurring everywhere in very strange configurations. Yes? Does magnetic reconnection have to happen in such an orderly fashion, or can it be 
can occur when the, I guess, formations <coughs> are in other um, formations. It, it doesn't have to, yeah, it can happen in, in all kinds of ways. Okay. And sometimes it's very complicated. Sometimes it's actually very close to the surface. Sometimes it's above the surface. So this is a very simple representation. And in fact, it's much more complicated. And, uh, and, it, and it happens all over uh, the sun, in fact. My favorite topic, very, very favorite topic, uh, is our solar prominences, which I was complaining about <laughs> that they show you in the media, calling them flares. These are these little things, actually they're not so little, they're, some of them are quite large, these objects that stick outside of the this, this solar surface, and that's why I think they name them prominences, because they these prominent structures sticking above uh, the eclipse pictures. And these are very, uh, actually relatively dense material, it's at chromospheric temperatures and density, but it's high up, in the, it's up in the corona. It's a very strange thing that happens. Just to give you an idea of scale, this is, the, this is to scale, this is the size, this is the Earth, and you take this one and zoom in. So mm. these are very, very large. Um, I call them small, What's relative the to other things. I'm sorry? What's the material? It's, mo it's hydrogen and helium, okay. and it's partially ionized, meaning that you have right. some ionized material, and it's very strange <laughs> that these things are actually up in the corona, because the corona is much, hotter and much less dense. It's, it's, it's an incredible difference in density. Here is, a, here is a huge, so you can see why I said this one was small. This one is really, really large. This is the limb of the sun. And this is what I consider a, a helical structure or a slinky. And I, I think most people would agree, uh, maybe, that it looks, it looks very much like a, like a flux rope or a slinky. And this was called the, this was the granddaddy prominence of 1946. And you can see the, the scale that they can be extremely large. When you when you see these things against the solar disk, they're called filaments. They're the same thing. I don't know why they had to be named something different, but they appear. <laughs> <laughs> it's frustrating. We have a lot of terminology in solar physics that can be very confusing. Uh, so when when they're on the limb, they stick up. But when they're on the disk, they're actually these elongated structures that appear dark because they're absorbing material from below. Um, and so here is a long filament. If it once it goes over the limb, it appears as a, as a structure that's sticking up. So these are actually sitting high up in the corona, but they they appear differently or they look different when they're on the disc. Here's a, here's a comparison of the two. So here is the prominence on, on the limb. This is the solar surface, and you can see this weird structure. And here's what this is a, a different one, but it has a, a similar strange structure. And we point out that we name these things different, uh, these different types of uh, the parts of the structure. This is the spine that connects the foot points, and these are little barbs that connect also to the surface. Yes? I noticed earlier that you're in one of your slides that the radiation zone can get to 1.5 kKelvin, mm -hmm. but the convection zone can be between 0.5 and 2. It, it, it depends, yeah. So again, okay. it depends on the very hot part can get very hot, and so it's not exactly a linear drop-off in temperature okay. throughout the interior of the sun as well. My question was, could that be related in any way to filaments that are prominences? Um, good question. It, uh, it's not because these are okay. very different, and the, the processes that are taking place are very different. Uh, but to, to be honest, we don't understand why, how these form, <laughs> for mm. one thing, and why they're suspended, why they're held up. And we suspect, well, we know that partly they're held up by the magnetic field uh, because they are uh, partially ionized and you need ionized material to be connected with the magnetic field. But other than that, we're still trying to understand why they form, how they form, and why they are as odd as they are. Um, yes? Uh, are, is it's mostly surface uh, stuff. Is this is not propagated throughout the, the entire star, though? Is it? Can you see evidence that it is? It, well, it's on the surface. Yes, right. it's on the surface. So this is just a bunch of noise going on on the surface. Where basically, <laughs> if I was sitting in the middle in right. the core, I wouldn't know that all. You'd have a lot of other different noise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a very different type yeah. of noise. Yes. None of the stuff is is happening inside. This is all mm. definitely above above the surface. And just in case you were looking, wondering about some of the, the fundamental properties, um, they can last really long. They can, they, can, they can last rotations on the sun. Um, and when I say last, uh, I should explain what that means. Um, they, they do have limited lifetimes. They, they <coughs> erupt, and they erupt into these solar stars. 
that are associated with solar flares. And I'm going to show you um, actually some cool movies of that happening. How okay. dynamic are they over the lifetime? Um, that's very, so they actually are very dynamic even when they're quiet. And I'm going to show you a movie of a quiet one. But they often drain material and then they often erupt. And I'll show you this. But they can be very dynamic. Why is that not working? There we go. Okay, so this is just a slight introduction because um, <laughs> of our, our, the, the studio that made the, the movie. Uh, but this is going to show you this incredible erupting. This starts out as a filament, so you can see it on the disc ahead of time. And this is in this wavelength here. So we're looking at, this is about 80,000 Kelvin. It's not as hot as the corona. It's just right in that middle. This is hot. And you can see once the eruption occurs from this little area here, going to occur, and then all of a sudden material is also falling back to the sun. So not only does it erupt, isn't it great? This, I, actually, I studied this very event. I studied the impact of material. Once the material comes falling back to the surface, mm -hmm. see how it's brightening up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I did a cal we did a calculation to figure out how much energy was uh, being deposited on the surface. Uh, but this, is, this was actually not a very large filament that erupted, but you can see the amount of material that came up. And, and some of it escaped, meaning that it came and it went out with a coronal mass ejection, uh, but some of it fell back to the surface. So this is pretty. Oh, wait till. Can you guys duplicate this? Duplicate? In no, they do. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, not, that's a good question. They there are some lab experiments where they can get to pr prominence temperatures and they yeah. kind of have a little bit of the same structure. But it's not quite, they're not quite realistic, but it's, it's, it's not bad, so they kind of can, but to, uh, not to do the eruption part and the magnetic reconnection part. That If we could do that on a regular basis, we'd have fusion yes, power. Yes, we would. That would be, that would be wonderful. Yeah, fusion is a good thing. Yeah. Can you identify a filament and then, based on its characteristics, predict when it's going to erupt? Excellent. Yes. Well, no. <laughs> but that, but that's what we're trying to do. That is the goal, is to say, Okay, we know that this filament has a certain twist this way, and it's and it's starting to rise or it's starting to do funny things. We know that that's going to erupt. We haven't got there yet, but we are studying that very thing, and not just the filaments, but also uh, the sunspots and the regions around the sunspots. Very good question. So that hopefully will lead to real prediction at some point. Um, this is a oh, my movies are not wanting me to click on them. <coughs> Need your experts up there. Doing I know. I should have had Rachel up here <laughs> or, or Charlotte. Okay. So this. The reason I'm showing this, you can see there. Let me uh, once it loops again. There's one filament here, one filament here, and all of a sudden this one erupts. Now watch. This one all of a sudden erupts as well. You can see that dark material lifting up. <laughs> we have to name this something. So they named this sympathetic. Sympathetic eruptions, <laughs> meaning that there might be a connection that the one erupting created some weird magnetic configuration that changed the other one and caused it to erupt as well. So these prominences are very, very uh, dynamic as well. Here is a close-up of just a part of a little prominence or filament, since it's on the disk. I should get my terminology right. Look at this very fine structure. Very weird, very hairy. <laughs> Um, we don't understand why it has such fine structure. This is one thing that I'm trying to study myself, is why, what sets that spatial scale. And of course, we're limited also by the spatial resolution of the instruments that we're using. So we're trying to get higher and higher resolution instrumentation. And let me show you what I was talking about, a very uh, quiet type prominence. And even with the quiet prominence, there's a lot of motion going on. Actually, this one, I, I didn't expect this. <coughs> The scale that you're working on <coughs> is actually quite large. It is, it? yes, yes. And, and, and this is, uh, first, okay, you're probably distracted, I'm guessing, by this little hairy stuff sticking up here. Spicules. Yep, spicules. And spicules have become very uh, important lately in, in um, theories about how the corona is heated. Some people are thinking that these little things shooting up into the, uh, to the corona, because this is chromospheric temperature, so this is relatively cool temperature uh, compared to the corona. And they think that these spicules are, are heating the corona by spitting material up in energy. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that, just to mention that that's um, part of what's going on. But the problem is you can see all this motion upward. You can see some 
strange twisting motion at some point. This is considered a, a quiescent prominence, meaning it ha it's not erupting. It's actually quite stable. It lasts a long time, but there's a lot of activity. There's still a lot of weird activity going on, and we don't understand. Um, you know, we're trying to figure out what the magnetic structure is based on some of these observations. Yes. Um, am I looking at this wrong, or is there some falling back? Yes, there's also material falling back. There's some going up. And if anybody's familiar with the Rayleigh-Taylor instability, um, then that's we think that that's what's going on here. It reminds me of a lava lamp. <laughs> yeah. I, oh my gosh, it really does actually. Maybe that's why I'm so attracted to it. So we've already seen this. <laughs> it's so mesmerizing. We've already seen these rubies, but I wanted to point out, because now that you know about filaments and prominences, um, look at this poor little guy down here. Do you see the wave just completely blasts by it, causes it to disappear for a while, and the poor filament is oscillating and survives. Like, it's surprise. Why doesn't this one erupt? I mean, this huge wave comes by, disturbs it, yet that doesn't erupt. So, we're trying to understand why some of them erupt, some of them don't, and how something like that can survive such a, a large um, disturbance. And part of it is that the, the wave is higher up. There's a lot of details. But there are no sunspots at that at those latitudes, are there? Not many, no, no, yeah. not, not at those latitudes. I, this was in 2006, so it was, um, yeah, no, there shouldn't be. Just to, as an example, we can take that interaction. So I looked at that filament and said, well, I, that, I can learn something about the energy going on here. And you can, I measured the period to be um, 30 minutes for the oscillations, and it was real obvious um, if you zoomed in and in amplitude. Um, basically, I could figure out what's going on. What, is the, what are the forces that make the, the prominence or the filament um, bounce back? And, so, and the fact that it was resilient. This also told me stuff about the wave properties themselves. I just wanted to show this as an example of the, uh, when we look at these observations and the types of uh, interactions, we can extract actual real um, neat physical properties of these types of behavior, uh, but I won't go into details. Okay, here's for some real, I'm going to say eye candy, because it really is. Um, and the reason I'm showing this now is because you've, you've now heard about all of this really, really neat dynamic activity. And this is a nice sort of long movie. I'm going to show this again at the end when we're talking. So if you don't feel if you if you want to see something again, it'll play again. This is from SDO, um, which did launch in 2010, and has been it's providing unprecedented data in terms of spatial resolution and temporal resolution. If you uh, can imagine downloading a million and a half iTunes a day. That's how much data uh, wow. SDO is providing us. <laughs> and it's taking an image every 10 seconds. And it's, it has 11 wavelengths. So it's taking uh, data in 11 different wavelengths and with very high temporal resolution and spatial resolution, which this projector is not doing it justice. But the, uh, you can see the very detailed loops here. And you're going to see a ton of activity. You're going to recognize some of the activity because we've already talked about it. That, what, we don't even know what that is. That doesn't fall into any of the other uh, <laughs> categories that I've talked about. Something new. Yeah, exactly. We're always <laughs> And this is a huge <coughs> thing right here. Look at this problem. It's all wait. That's an eclipse. The, <laughs> the eclipses can't happen in, in actual uh, space warrant instrumentation as well. Um, this is zoomed in, active region. Here's a nice prominence in a very weird structure. It looks like it's twisting. Here's another filament eruption. Look at the twist. Now, if you notice down here in a bit, it, this is going to look like it's even twisting even more. <coughs> and that material is escaping, OK? I'm not sure why this is spinning, but that was a huge wave. That you, Did you notice that wave passing by there? Um, Should I understand that there's energy invested in the curvature when their uh, arcs are small, and as that curvature adopts larger radii curvature, it's less yeah. curved, mm -hmm. the energy is released, and that's what drives it? it? It's not necessarily what drives it, but you're right that there is an energy change. Uh, so it could be, it could be part of it, is, is that the, the more curved you get, the more tension, and then the, yeah. the more, but it, it, it's intimately involved with this magnetic reconnection, and that's really what's going on. In fact, so flares um, and the prominence eruptions are basically manifestations of the same physical process, which is the magnetic reconnection. Um, but they're they're different beasts. But they're both they both have that magnetic reconnection going on 
causing them. So that's it's it's easy to get confused between um, these different types of things. That's Venus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's Did anybody cool. get to see that? Uh, the, the, oh yeah. For the last time uh, in our lifetimes. So that was really neat. And those are the different wavelengths. So. Another, another big flare. Okay, so I think you've seen enough of these. Is that a flare or a filament? That was a flare. Okay. You know what? Though a lot of times a flare will go off and a filament will be erupting from the same region. Mm. So you get this. You get the two things happening um, from the same region. This is what we call coronal rain again, because we have to label everything. But it's just hot. It's hot material that's cooling and falling back down. Is it possible that the anchorage of these phenomena? Like I'm, I'm still thinking about that little. Yeah. Filament that you know got bumped around but kind of returned to right. the same spot. Yep. Did it be anchored at a much lower altitude? Yes, and or um, that the magnetic fields above it uh -huh. are very strong, holding it down. Gotcha. So you're absolutely right. Yes, it it, it, it has probably uh, it's related to all of those things. But we haven't had a systematic way of just of figuring out why some of them erupt, some of them don't. Now coronal mass ejections are these large eruptions that go away from the sun, and they travel a lot of times four million miles an hour, and they're really, really fast, really, really large, and they are oftentimes, um, they have prominences embedded in them. So this is an erupting prominence, which we're all familiar with now, and it's part of this larger structure called the coronal mass ejection, or CME. And so here's that big bubble that's erupting, the prominence is in the middle of it. And these originate from these helmet streamer regions, where you already have a magnetic field trapped trapping all the hot plasma, and it just turns out that they end up erupting as well. Here is a movie of one huge one. I, most of the times they're very, very large. We, had, we do have smaller ones as well. Um, this is a chronograph, so this is from space, a uh, fake eclipse. The sun is actually this white circle here. You can see how large these things can be, incredibly large. And that's what's ejecting is... Um Protons, protons? It's it's actually yeah. I mean it's it's electrons. It's all of the the plasma. So okay. it's all the mass and the magnetic field. So it's ejecting both the magnetic field and all the hot plasma. Okay. Um, here is a zoomed out view of these mass ejections. This is a di these are different events. Uh, you can see the sun now is this small little circle. This is just the the arm holding the occulting disk. So it's a, it's a, just an artifact. But look, you can see these huge things erupting not just in the north, but you see this halo type thing. Well, that means if you're looking at one of these structures, which is kind of like a cone, if you're looking at it from this direction, it's coming at you, it's actually going to appear like this, this halo type thing. And you're seeing that here. Now, you don't know if that's going away from you or moving <coughs> towards you. In this case here, we know it's coming towards us because look at all of the snow. <coughs> that it, that is all of the um, energetic particles hitting the detector on the telescope. And it's causing this, this snow. That was the last picture, right? Yes. <laughs> no, 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 I can recover from that. But it's, it's kind of neat because you're looking, you're actually seeing space weather right here. This is space weather. When I talk about space weather, it, it's how these dynamic things affect us here on Earth and at other planets as well, and our telescopes and our other missions. And here you can see it happening. This halo was coming at us. So when I talk about solar storms, I'm mostly referring to coronal mass ejections. And I'm just going to show you beautiful effects when that happens. So when they do happen to hit the Earth and are very strong, they can cause stronger aurora, which I still haven't seen in real life. Really? Oh. Uh, <laughs> That's a bucket list we, It is. We drove to Vermont not, uh, last month, searching, going on a little bit of a aurora run. Didn't ha didn't work out. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Was it, was it coronal mass ejection responsible for the loss of telegraph service yes. in the mid 19th century? Yes. So there's this huge, huge event called the Carrington event. Um, and that is, is one of the largest flares. It also had a huge coronal mass ejection associated with it. And absolutely, the coronal mass ejection uh, is, again, is all this magnetic field and mass. The magnetic field, when it hits the Earth, interacts with the Earth's magnetic field. And that's what causes these energetic particles to get kind of trapped near the polar regions. So you have the Earth's magnetic field, you have the coronal mass ejection coming, and magnetic reconnection can occur. 
and then you get these particles that get accelerated down towards the poles where the magnetic fields are mostly um, on the surface of the Earth. But when you have very strong uh, storms, like that one that happened in the Carrington event, they were seeing aurora at, at very low latitudes. And I, I, they were reading the newspaper um, at night with no light because the aurora was so bright and the telegraphs got messed up. So that was an incredibly strong event. We hope we don't see one like that now because yeah. these things affect our technology. Sure. Yeah, it would be a yeah. bad, bad thing. Unfortunately, we're so technologically dependent that it really, really can, can hurt us. And just a, a short little uh, description of why you see the different colors. It, it, it has to do with the, the energetic particles interacting with the atmospheric um, atoms and, and which, uh, which ones they interact with and excite and then de-excite gives you the different types of colors. I think I'm running out of time. So, so we should think of these as neutral plasma or largely essentially neutral? No, they're, they're, no, they're ionized plasma. They're very energetic. No, ionized, but <laughs> neutral in charge. There, there, there's no, at this point, there's no neutral material coming out from the sun. When it's erupting yeah, like it's, that, it's all, electron. it's all ionized. It's all, there's no uh, neutral. It's all protons? It's, all it's a, a, mostly protons, high energetic protons. And not the corresponding electrons. I know it's some of the some of the electrons as well. So the the, the mass ejections carry all of that with them. And well, then we don't know the charge. We, uh, really. I think that well. It takes an awful lot of energy to separate charge. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I the, they they there's a, a wide range of energies that cause these different things. And and I'm not an energetic particle person, but I know that they can just they can detect which ones are the ones that are causing like the aurora. But uh, but yeah, they're just high energetic uh, particles. Um, I already mentioned a little bit space weather. Uh, they, it, 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 it causes the aurora, which is beautiful, but there are also bad things that it causes. It can cause problems with our satellites, our communication satellites, even uh, our GPS, which we are now dependent on. Uh, so it becomes very important to be able to predict when these are going to hit the Earth. I mean, you can have coronal mass ejections and flares happening all over the sun, uh, but when are they going to hit the Earth? When are they going to actually cause problems? Because even if they hit the Earth, does not mean they're going to cause problems. So there's, it's a very complicated thing to model one of these coronal mass ejections coming to the Earth, understanding which uh, orientation the magnetic field will be, because it, it also gets embedded in the, um, in the solar wind, which has different speeds. So it's a very complicated thing to model, and we're getting better and better at it, but it's very hard to, to predict not only when they're going to occur, but if they're going to even cause problems or be geomagnetic. And uh, this, can cost, this can cost a lot, a lot of money per year. Power grids go down. 1989, North America suffered from a large solar storm. Uh, I think they were out for nine hours in some areas. So the power grids going down right now is, is kind of a big deal. Um, it could cause a lot of problems. Um, polar flights. Now, when you're flying over the poles, which people are doing more and more now, um, the navigation over the poles becomes a little bit dangerous. Not dangerous, but you get exposed to more radiation if one of these storms hits and you're flying over the poles. Uh, what airlines do uh, is they actually will reroute their flights if they know that there's a potential storm coming, which is great because if you're a passenger, you're, you're, you're going to be exposed to a little bit more radiation, but it's their, you know, the, the pilots and the people, the flight attendants, they don't want to be constantly uh, exposed to that much radiation. So that's also another problem. You can go just on the website, spaceweather.com, to find out today's space weather, just like you check the weather on Earth. Um, <laughs> I have an, out, an outdated uh, snapshot, but it's a very, very neat uh, website if you're interested in aurora alerts or anything that's related to space weather. Is that from Goddard? No, it's not. But the, the, actually, the guy that runs the site um, has done work. He's a contractor for NASA, so he does. he's related. But, um, but what Goddard does have, <laughs> that's a nice segue, uh, we run this uh, community coordinated modeling center, which which is where uh, international people um, work together to model these things, and we we do send out predictions uh, not for humans but for the missions, the, the satellites. Uh, so we actually send out uh, alerts saying, okay, there was this really big flare, and our models show that a CME might hit the Earth. So do something about. It. You can turn your satellites into safe mode. Uh, because they can be very much impacted by these things hitting them. But heliophysics at NASA is really on it. We have a whole fleet 
of missions looking not just at the sun, but how things are in, how things are impacted here at Earth. These are looking at the magnetic reconnection going on here at the Earth. Um, this isn't even updated. We have one that launched uh, recently, and I'm going to show you a little bit of data from that. But just to show you, it's not just a simple thing. You can't. I showed you a bunch of solar data looking at the sun. That's great. But it it's really requires looking way beyond that, not just at the sun, but how it's impacting the Earth, how it's impacting other planets, and all the way to the edge of the heliosphere, which we've already sort of talked about. Voyager's already there. We have a mission that is actual, actually able to sort of uh, image the edge of the solar system. So it's very, very neat system science. It's not just one simple thing. And I'm going to show you, this is very, very new data, and that's why I wanted to show you. Um, IRIS is a new mission that we sent up recent, I can't remember how many months ago, and it is, it's the square here, and it's overlaid on SDO data, but you can see the resolution. This is looking at the transition region, that region where that temperature increase happens, that very steep temperature increase, and look at the, the little resolution here, and it's a spectrograph as well, but this was the largest flare that it has caught so far, and I just thought it was neat because this data just came out, and I wanted to share it with you as part of this talk. Okay, well, <laughs> it's very hard to study the sun when you can't go to the sun. Um, I've, we can look at the beautiful images, uh, but we can't actually go to the sun and, and get data, right? I mean, here on Earth, we have the ability to actually collect data right where we are. However, there is hope because we have two missions in development. Uh, one is Solar Pro Plus which will fly very close to the sun. It's gonna fly within nine solar radii. So it's one radius of the sun times that by nine, which sounds, doesn't sound like that close, but actually it's extremely close. That's very exciting. And at the same time, this is probably gonna launch in 2018, and Solar Orbiter is the mission I mentioned earlier that is also gonna go fairly close to the sun, <laughs> within 60 solar radii, but it's gonna be um, on an inclined orbit. So it's gonna take a few Venus gravity assists to get it into an inclined orbit, and then we'll be able to look at the polar region. So that's a very, very uh, good thing if it, uh, as long as it goes. Okay, I don't know how much time I have. I'm probably running out of time. That's so. Saturday night. Okay, <laughs> like, okay. I only have, okay, I only have a couple <laughs> more slides, but I, just, I also wanted to bring up uh, Comet Ison, which was a relatively recent event. Um, how many of you paid attention to that? Were you disappointed that it didn't survive? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it, it didn't Absolutely. really survive, right? Here's, here are the... Uh, part of it. Yeah. Let's see. Here is... Oh, come on, movie. Okay, let me try this one. So this is my last slide, apparently. <laughs> I can tell. Okay, here it is. Oh. Here it's coming into the chronograph. And yeah. it does. A little bit it, there's a ghost of it surviving, right? Mm -hmm. Um, some of my colleagues, were, or maybe it was a media outlet, they called this the zombie comment. Because <laughs> <laughs> we didn't think it survived. Life after death. <laughs> <laughs> we had reported that it didn't survive, and the reason we reported that is because SDO did not see anything. And SDO saw something in the last time. Do you remember the comment Lovejoy? Yeah. Okay, here's what S... Oh, come on, movies. I need to get a Mac, I think. Here we go. Yes. <laughs> okay, so this is going to look like it's not doing anything for a second. But what's going to happen, Lovejoy, and we're going to zoom in in this region here, and Lovejoy is going to come and it's right very close to the sun, and you'll see it come through this way. There it is. It's little. And you'll see these wiggles. Yeah. That was really neat. That was the tail interacting with the magnetic field. And all of a sudden, <laughs> Here it is, it survived. So they saw Comet Lovejoy quite easily in SDO. And we set up this entire campaign. Uh, SDO even changed how it was observing for ISON to catch it. And they didn't see a thing, not a single thing. And that is why it was early on reported that it didn't survive. And then it kind of, after the white light data came back, it's like, well, we sort of survived. <laughs> Unfortunately, it didn't survive enough for us to see it in the night sky after after it, it did actually end up um, it evaporating. It, it, yeah, so it was more of a zombie comet. There's, there seem to be patches of, of some extent where the feet of several different um, arcs are planted. 
what is in common over those areas? In, on the sun? Yeah, on the, uh, on the apparent surface, there seem to be patches yeah. where several different arcs have their feet. Right? Yep, those are What's kind in of, common over those areas? Uh, just that there are intense magnetic fields, so it, it might be sunspot region, and a lot of them are, the foot points are the same, but the loops kind of go in different directions, mm -hmm. but they're very, they're planted in the, in the same region. And those are just bundles of magnetic field, basically. So they have in common that they originate and end in the same spot, but the loops are in different spatial areas as they are above the surface. For some period of time, it was postulated that there were acoustic yep. uh, energies arriving at a surface. I think that's been abandoned. Though. Um, it, it hasn't been completely abandoned, but they are now uh, thinking, whoops, oh, shoot. I can't talk and do this at the same time. Um, I was going to put on the, uh, the eye candy while we uh, discuss things. Um, but yeah, so they're, they're they, they, the acoustic waves have been thought of in terms of a lot of things, in terms of coronal heating and the, the heating <coughs> of the loops, uh, but there's also waves, alphane waves that might be heating things. So there's a variety of, of theories and we just can't yet determine exactly which one is the right theory. So um, that was all that I had. Any other questions? And I forget, if you're sitting behind this light and you've been raising your hand, I can't see you, so if you... <laughs> Shout out. <laughs> yeah, so let's, let's thank our speaker in the house. Yes. <laughs> I think you want a little bit over there. Yes. Two quick questions. What causes the magnetic field to flip, and what is the difference between um, our, our sun and a magnet? Ooh, good question. The, uh, the reason, we don't fully understand why the magnetic fields flip. I mean, to simply sort of try to explain it, it's because of the, the way that the magnetic field gets all tangled up and gets so complicated into multipolar fields, and it, and it releases itself from these eruptions, and it, and it goes back to a, a, less, a, a lower energy state. And so it goes from solar maximum to solar minimum, and in the process, the the magnetic fields, because of the way that it's rotating and the way they're interacting, migrate, the, the sunspots migrate, and, and then you end up getting the different polarity on, on the south and then the opposite on the north. So it's just a, a matter of the complicated way that the, the <coughs> motions happen. But what was strange is the, the one that just flipped, the, we just flipped uh, recently, the south pole had flipped over a year and a half ago. And so it, it, we actually had kind of two of the same polarities. I mean, that's on a very uh, average sense. So it's not that there's a north and a north, but there was more north and more north in, in both hemispheres until finally the north caught up and did actually flip. So it's very weird how that happens. We don't understand uh, the, the solar dynamo very well. Um, and that's the dynamo is really responsible for all of this motion and, and causing the solar cycle. It wasn't a simple dipole at all. No, no. So you have a lot of motion in the sun that we still don't even know about, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. We, I mean, we're, we're trying to model it better and better, and, you know, and we're getting closer to understanding, but yeah, there's a, still a lot we don't know. Well, yes. I think it was a power shutdown a few years ago in Quebec. Mm -hmm. Was that caused by a solar Yes, that was the one in 1989 that I was talking about. That was, that was absolutely caused by a solar storm, um, and, and I think that caused, I don't, I don't know how much, I mean, besides the fact that the power was out for nine hours, I don't know if that caused people to go crazy. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine if that happens in a large city, that could cause a lot of chaos, and so it's a little scary. Well, Montreal is a large city. Well, yeah, that's true. But they, maybe not as crazy as something. Uh, yes. Hi. Did you say big power outage? about the primary, secondary sources of solar neutrinos? Um, I can't because I'm not a Nushino person, <laughs> and so I apologize. I, I, I can't. It's just the proton-proton chain generates, the core generates the neutrinos. It's the, the core. core. Yeah. yeah, I do know that much, but I don't know anything beyond that. Isn't it curious that neutrinos come out immediately? The interior yeah, probably. they don't have, they're not stopped. They're, they're just, not stopped. Yeah, they don't go through that. If you want to use a lead to take half, yeah. half of them. They're not stopped by it, so they come out and they're just, yeah. yeah, they go right through. Yes. They go through us. I'm fascinated <laughs> with spicules. Do we know what causes them? <laughs> um, we, we don't. The chromosphere in general is this sort of, region that we are just now starting to study more. 
and I make this joke every time I talk, it used to be called, well, we, we used to refer to it, the ones that we were interested in the chromosphere, the ignorosphere, because it's so hard to understand, because the energy and the complicated uh, magnetic structure, it's where you go from the, the photosphere, it's where you have these, tr like, this transition to the corona, which involves a lot of weird stuff, including where the magnetic fields are more dominant than the plasma. So you have plasma beta. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It, it's this region where you have these transitions. And we're just now um, kind of drawing more attention to it because of spicules and, and the potential that they have for explaining uh, the coronal the heating problem. Energy transfer. But yeah. Don't they originate at the surface, at the yeah. photosphere? Yeah, they, they originate yes, and then I, generate up into the chromosphere. Yes. And we think that, I mean, magnetic reconnection might be causing them. But even then, it, you know, it's, it's, it, that's. It could be, but we don't know for sure. Good Thanks. Question. Not to explain anything, but yeah. to perhaps rationalize them. When you have a huge energy release, or there's energy source and sink, yeah. the interior of the sun and then space itself, you might expect a lot of parasitic modes. I submit that these little things we're studying here are tiny parasitics on this huge energy flux. Yeah, no, that's, and I, you're not, I, I mean, people have looked in that, and I think that's not. Uh, an uh, unreasonable thing to think. I, it's curious that we understand what's going on where we can't see in the middle and we can't understand what we see. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's, it is. I mean, I, and as we get uh, more and more sophisticated with the observations, the more confusing it becomes. I mean, I thought I understood something about prominences until some of the better data came out, and I was like, this is nothing what I thought. You know, the structure is not what I would have anticipated. So. Now, that's just the surface, but below we're still in a kind of a thought process that it's a model, we have to which it really isn't. We know it isn't, but a lot of it's there's probably eddies and mm -hmm. cross oh, yeah. currents and and whatever. All kinds of all kinds of yeah. um, turbulence and that I mean, we don't even know about. Right? Yeah, and we can model, and there you know we can model, but yeah, absolutely, we have I mean, to assume. <clears throat> know quite a bit from global oscillation. Yeah, yeah. Gl right. Luckily, we can we can we can sort of see inside the sun because we can look at the waves that are coming out and we can look at, just like seismology on Earth, we can use helioseismology to know some stuff about the internal. Okay, I didn't know who he's choosing. He's, I'll let you take it over. In the very beginning when you were talking about the heliosphere breathing and so forth, yeah. it looked a lot like what you see the solar wind doing to the Earth. Mm -hmm. In other words, there was Yep. Looked like it was being pushed. Absolutely. What was pushing it? In the in the case of the heliosphere, the sun is tra the sun and the solar system and the heliosphere is traveling through uh, interstellar space at incredible speeds. And as it's doing so, it's causing a bow shock, just like you know any anything traveling through another medium. So that's why it has that distorted uh, shape. And similarly, uh, the wind from the sun is blowing the Earth's magnetic field, which is also distorted in the same type of shape. So it's very similar. Uh, yep. Just say it's dark matter. <laughs> yeah, if you don't know the answer, just say dark matter. In one of your early slides, in one of your early slides, you showed the layer of the sun and there were multiple convection zones with different sizes of cells. Yeah, yeah. There's How well known is the structure of that? The reason that we know there are these sort of larger cells and then the smaller cells, and we can see the cells when they are on the surface. Uh, we can, so we know the size of, those, of the cells to some extent, um, but we don't honestly, I mean, we don't know exactly everything that's going on below that, but we can, we can at least estimate the size of the cells because we can't see them. I didn't show any data to show that, but you can actually see the, cell, the, the convection motion on the surface when you look at it. Is there something you see in sunspots or in um, no, those are um, because those are different types of regions, and so this the uh, the cells that you're seeing are more on the quiet, the other parts of the sun, okay. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. I'll let you. <laughs> okay. we, you were showing us the the, the different solar cycles. Mm -hmm. What's the uh, evidence you're thinking? Are we going for toward, toward another longer than <laughs> There has been talk recently that we are, um, but there's, there's also, there are scientists that believe that we're not. Uh, we will not know until it's passed. So, unfortunately, <laughs> it's, it's, we, we can say once we've passed this next solar maximum and then go to the next solar minimum. 
Uh, I don't believe we're in another modern minimum because we've seen, you know, we have seen things and we've been, we've had quite a bit of activity. Uh, and the solar cycle is, you know, it's a, it's a complicated thing and sunspots are one way to measure it, but coronal mass ejections and flares are another. Um, the output, uh, the irradiance output is another. So there are these, a lot of things that go into the cycle. Uh, it's to be determined. Uh, but I personally, based on from what I've seen and heard, I don't think we're headed towards another modern minimum. I think we have had some periods of, of very low uh, activity, but I think it's not as severe as that one minimum, which was very, very severe. Uh, Jay, we'll yeah, take one more, more question. My more question was just asked. Okay. Oh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, uh, we do have some observing tonight. Amazingly enough, the sky became clear. Nice. Um, Yay. Yeah. So, uh, it cleared up right after the occultation. Please come up and let's thank our speaker again.